our third and sadly final uh, <laughs> our third and final uh, lunchtime lecture for this semester. Uh, we have a special event for you today. Uh, Jason Hale and his colleague from the uh, theatre, what do we call it? Performing Arts? I'm not sure it's theatre or It's, the, it's theatre department. Right, yeah. theatre department. Uh, Bill Kent will be shortly beginning what's been billed as a one-on-one -on -one conversation about uh, directing American plays in Turkey. I will give a short introduction to our speakers, but before I do that, I would just like to uh, say, uh, kind of for the record, that uh, the library was very sad uh, two weeks ago when the university lost Talat Halman. Uh, he was the first ever of our lunchtime speakers back in 2008, I think it was, and he actually gave his support to this uh, series of talks. So, uh, for a variety of reasons, but especially from the lunchtime team, we want to express our, our condolences to Bill Kent uh, in general for, for his loss. Okay, let me briefly introduce our speakers, and I shall be as quickly as uh, short as possible. Uh, Jason Hale is a visiting ass assistant professor and chair of the theatre department at Bill Kent. Uh, he has a diploma in graduate acting from the New Actors New Workshop in New York, and also an MA in directing from Antioch University Midwest in Ohio. I thought first it was Antakya or something like that. Yeah, Antioch. <laughs> He has over 20 years professional experience within the performing arts uh, field, both uh, in the US but internationally as well. Uh, he's a teacher of acting uh, and a proponent of what apparently is called the Viola Spolin method uh, of acting. Uh, he's also had experience as an actor professionally, uh, both on stage, on film and on television, uh, and he's uh, an accomplished director and producer. I should add at this point that we at the library have benefited from his his uh, experience and skills because he helped us during September when we did a little scenario, an acting scene about the library for the G100 Introduction to Academic Life. And he was the he was brought in at the last minute to, to kind of make it professional and uh, we were very happy for his help there. Uh, our other speaker today, uh, uh, Jason's colleague from the Theatre Department, uh, Melten keskin Bayou, uh, uh, as well as being a part-time instructor here, she is also a Turkish State Theatre actress uh, with a great experience over many years of acting uh, uh, on the Turkish stage. Uh, she has a BA in acting from Hacettepe University and has won many accolades and awards for her performances. Now I think we're going to start with a short video and then our speakers will take it from there in their special way. Okay. Thank you very much. Special way. Can you watch yourself? I can't, it's not easy to watch on So, <clears throat> let's start this conversation. <laughs> yes, Jason, how was it? So, okay. Well, the reason we played this is because this is the whole reason I'm here at Bill Kent University. In 2011, I was very lucky to have been asked to direct a Tennessee Williams play for the Turkish State Theater to celebrate Tennessee's, what would have been in his 100th birthday. Um, and we thought about different Tennessee Williams plays and then we finally settled on Search of Kemes, 
Um, and then I met Meltan. <clears throat> um, I auditioned several people to play uh, the role of Amanda. And when Meltan walked in, she spoke English, number one, uh, very well, with a British accent. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I knew as a director, you know, I'm not worried with what somebody looks like. I'm more interested in what the essence is, what somebody understands about the role that they're gonna play. And immediately I felt that with you, that you knew this in some way, right? Deep yeah. down. And then it began a whole process of uh, working on John Ugell's translation. Uh, which was one of the bigger challenges, right? As well-respected and as famous as John yes. Ugell is, yes. he missed major things in his translation of this play, particularly the Blue Roses, yes. right? Are you all familiar with the play, Sochi Kames? So it's, an, it's a semi-autobiographical play about Tennessee Williams' life. Um, the role of Laura is based on his sister, whose name was Rose. And he cleverly put in the play that uh, the, the, the daughter in the play, Laura, has this illness called pleurosis. And this boy in her school uh, kind of uh, playfully makes fun of her. And he says, oh, you had blue roses. So and then thinking about Tennessee Williams, about this being autobiographical, um, Tennessee's sister's name was Rose, as I mentioned, and he uses blue roses because there's no such thing as blue roses, and Laura lives in an imaginary world. So, in John Ugell's translation, he translated it to asparagus, which had no, had no meaning. No meaning. Really? It's not easy, though, for, for the roses, this illness and the sickness, and it is just, Tennessee is a poet, and He's very good in rhymes, and it was not easy all the time to try to make the rhyme that, that Tim, Jim would misunderstood mm. Laura. That was why, while it's been translated, it has been translated three times. Uh -huh. It is not, doesn't work, actually. Right. This time, but Gulin plays Laura. She, she did it, she mentioned. She found how to take, how to yes. find blue roses, yes. Yes. Marigo. Yes. But what illness was it? What was it? She, she, it was some illness that kind of rhymed with yes. Marigo. She right? found something how? that I'm too excited that I forgot. Okay. And I'm very excited. <laughs> it's fine being on stage, but I mean, just face to face with this, I'm Melton here. So it's sorry that it's I'm different. very excited. and. My English, whatever the accent is, can run away in a minute. Just I'm so afraid and now excited. So well, we'll I talk can't. about a few things. Yeah. We'll talk about uh, translation, casting, and the rehearsal process of working on Fine. an American play. Like, what do you work on? What did we work on together? You know, with Sergio Kames to find that understanding. One thing we were talking about earlier is about how. This play is about a woman who grew up in a small town in the South, uh, very wealthy. And then she moved to, she met her husband and she moved to the, you know, a lower middle class urban area in St. Louis, right? So that was one of the things we kind of worked on because you said, well, in Turkey, most people that live outside the urban environments are they tend to be low, lower, lower class. And in the center of cities in Turkey, they tend to be more affluent. Kind of, right? yeah. No, it's kind of changing, but it was. And it is, but as a, as a story story, it's a very well-known story that you can be a daughter with a very wealthy family and you can fall in love with someone that not at the same level. And the parents would say no, so you run away with him. And, your life can be a disaster easily if you start, I mean, the husband leaves you, and when you see that the kids, the children that you have, not the ones that you were looking for, all your youth had gone. Mm -hmm. So it is somehow as an actress, we're starting by, it's who is she, this woman, who is she, where is she, what does she think and feel, so then, it's a, then it starts a big, big, big research that you read, start reading hundreds of 
papers that about the writer and the environment, southern people, the American theater, whatever, lost lives, broken hearts and this. And so you can dig into this story. The story is important, yes. mainly. <clears throat> I think um, you've been with the State Theater a long time, right? The State Theater has embraced and has performed a lot of American plays, yeah. right? It is very clever that the foundation of the country <clears throat> the first thing that Ataturk wanted this conservatory, the first thing he asked for, genius, and then the university's genius. He knew what he was <clears throat> looking forward and what, what he was thinking that the country and the people <clears throat> should aim to, should go to, the follow which roads, whatever. So the state theater, the law, it says, it doesn't say it might, doesn't say state theater can do or state theaters. It's not better to state theater do this, do that. It says state theaters do American plays, state theaters do foreign plays, state theaters do translations, state theaters do Turkish plays. It tours um, um, local, yeah, Turkish playwrights and encourages and wants people so it, it it was a mission that the state theater was the founding so it was i think a very big thing that people started translating all the plays all the plays worldwide mm. it's a big thing perfect that that's why maybe the turkish theater history if we look the actresses and actors and as a start it's very rich full of examples. It was not just something stayed in the local circumstances or limits. Mm -hmm. So that's why kind of, as actors and the audience that used to be more, not maybe nowadays we're in digital age, but know about the theatre, worldwide theatre, the same kind of, the same years that the, those plays are being done in their own. Mm countries so we're accustomed to it's unique though Turkey is unique in that regard it because is. the state theater is so big right you do so many plays a year that you tend Turkey tends to do more American plays than other countries really England, maybe Europe, except for Europe, England yeah. or uh, but Turkey really embraces those those I Western think, plays yeah. particularly from America Arthur Miller is a huge playwright here He's equally as big in America, but he's really big here. Yeah, he's a good writer. Yeah. This, <laughs> and the stories work here. Yeah. We understand and what he's talking and Tennessee about. Williams. Yeah. But you know, I was recently in China, and they hardly know who Tennessee Williams is, the theater people. They, hard, they hardly knew what the play Glass Menagerie was. So it, I just find it fascinating. Yeah. I think we had Turkish theatre, state theatres, or uh, Turkey had the same golden age uh, with the word this theatre, golden age of theatre. I think we had, uh, but didn't we kind of, we had all the plays and everybody is so proud that where the Harold Pinter is in London and was being produced the same time here in That's Turkey. That's really interesting. And very well acting too, uh -huh. very well directed too. We had it. It's like a legendary thing that we hear that there were queues for the tickets and people were going there at four o'clock in the morning and waiting for the box office open. Wow. It's a, we had a big, real golden age. When here. was this? 60s, 70s, 60s, just. So it's like you were, the plays that were happening in England or America, you were translating them right the same away time, and yes. performing them. Just and that that's point. not happening now? It is, I think. But I wonder, I think no new playwrights or the things that change, I'm not sure. Hmm. I mean, my friends in England, they're looking for new playwrights. <laughs> Just they yeah. say that we don't have strong playwrights anymore. Well, that's dying. It's dying in America too. They're all writing screenplays and it was TV maybe. shows. They're not writing plays anymore. Yeah. There's one big, huge writer, and it brings up the production that I recently directed with the students at 
the, the Bill Kim Theater, is Tracy Letts. He's one of our biggest playwrights. He, he wrote the play August in Osage County. Uh, I don't know if you saw it was turned into a movie, but he's one, one, you can say, current working playwright in America that has a strong voice. But in our golden age, <laughs> which was 40s, 50s, we had major, we had Tennessee Williams, Arthur Miller, all these major playwrights being performed on Broadway at the same time, and it doesn't exist anymore. No, no. Yeah. And it was, <clears throat> Ashik Luxia was talking about Tennessee Williams while it was just musicals and the theaters were being closed. Yeah. And then uh, it was a new policy about how will we just stand up this American theater again. So. In the abandoned cities in America, in all in America, they started founding small theaters that fit just so small venues like this, probably. So the writers started writing again mm -hmm. their stories, and people will understand. So, this realistic, magic realism that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. So, it started founding again, and Tennessee Williams was raised up. After these circumstances, she used to say, mm. Mm. in America, that's why it would be this Tennessee Williams should be played in small venues and to take the audience in it more. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Kind of to see every mimic, maybe move, mood, smell, whatever is there. Right, right. To be able to be be in the play, mm -hmm. kind of. In a more intimate yeah, environment. Intimate, yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't have to shout and you can just talk. Mm. Speaking of American plays, I just want to point out Joanne, Joanna Mansbridge, who is here. She's actually directing an American play, How I Learned to Drive, with, the, uh, with your American Literature Department. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be performed soon, right? Monday and Tuesday. Thank you. Monday, yes. <laughs> but that, and you're performing, it's being performed in English. It is, correct? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you right. could join in on this conversation. What has your experience been working with your students on this play that, for whatever it's worth, it's a little risky? Yeah, yeah. So my big concern was uh, it deals with delicate subject matter, so uh, sexual abuse. Um, but the students, you know, were initially nervous about that. But um, the cultural references, they, you know, are a little outdated for them if they would know them at all. Um, and formally, it's a very interesting play. Um, mm -hmm. and I think that's what, one of the reasons why I love it. Yeah. So the way it tells the story. Um, but you know, I still am wondering about um, how the audiences will, uh, how the audience will uh, react. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because of course there's nothing gratuitous about it, it's a beautifully told story. Right. Um, but I'm interested to know why it is, why Miller in particular, because I think there, you know, there, there's a pretty lot, and there's a lot of wonderful American playwrights. No, but, I know, I know, but it's very interesting too because they do Miller plays that Americans don't even know. <laughs> yeah, orchestra, which no one knows that play. It, it played two seasons ago and it got, had a lot of success, right? The, the Death of the Salesman is just done, yeah. And so, and I taught that uh, in this American theater. We know those lives. It's familiar, I mean, I don't know. Arthur it, Miller? Yeah. Is it the, the, the sort of historical context that's familiar, or the kind of like emotional, like family sort of atmosphere? I mean, let me just answer as an actress. Actress, actress, not the history or theater or it. But very strong stories. Death of a salesman can happen to anyone else. Everything is changing, capitalism, things are changing. But if stuck in things, don't see what's happening, they're all broken, broken lives. It's easy for me. It's very easy to understand why things are happening that way. Things are changing, he can't catch it. He's stuck, he's passed, he was fine, but it's not working anymore. It's not the system anymore. 
So it's easy to understand, it's easy to love that story. All these big skyscrapers and <coughs> small houses, we had the same things. We had Bakkals, now we have Real. I mean, who's going to fight with what it is? The world is having this. So this, if the story is strong, it works. If it's, a re if it's real, seems real. If you understand, if you have just witnessed even one sentence, one vision, anything from the story, from the text, it works in Turkey, probably in all around the world. We all had these, now we're always, we do all go to the same shops. It's terrifying, I mean, in all around the world, you go to a shopping mall and you see the same brands and where am I? What happened? What happened to the tailors? If there's a story about that, or such stories are all about these kind of things, and we all know it. Who goes to a tailor anymore? We just buy and throw if they, I don't know, it is. So that's why maybe Arthur Miller is very familiar to the it's, crucible, it's, it's, the crucible, it's, it's, it is everyone understanding the word. He's so genius. I mean, this Salem, we all about know this middle age and which is our being. It is, we all know. And then we all know just kind of being an intellectual or whatever that we all know McCarthy, period. In Turkey, we had wish we could have just like strong, strong playwrights then. I would like to read a good drama text about Sivas or whatever. I mean, do we having the same things? Of course, you understand it, you get it. <coughs> so he's writing kind of for all of us. Yeah, it's universal. We understand it's... the archetypes in the characters. We understand that. But yet, Death of the Salesman is something about it, even though Mike Nichols, who recently passed away, he was my teacher, he directed uh, a recent Broadway production of that. And he would say, you know, everybody knows this story because everybody is a salesman. <clears throat> everybody is a salesman. He said, but this play is specifically about a Jewish American salesman. And it's an experience that still works in many different productions and contexts. But the, that kind of unique struggle with the immigrants who came in that period, hmm. it's a really okay. strong story that had a bigger impact when it was first done and, than when it's done now. So this is why we actors need a director that talk about this for us and we work on that too. I mean, right. <laughs> with the current characters. Yes. So, you asked me early this morning, was there any difference between an American director, a foreign director, and a Turkish director? And I say, I mean, the directors can't be counted like that if it's their good directors and <clears throat> not make their homeworks or the directors that understand this story or not. Just I've been known foreign directors that didn't understand anything. What? is written there or don't understand this story. Sometimes directors have very bad habits that they, they have a vision, <clears throat> whatever is the vision is, or they have an idea, whatever the idea is. They insist on put that vision, an idea, whatever, in the play. A concept. It doesn't work because we say that the text asks for, sometimes text says what it needs. The story itself says what should it be done with the play. I mean, you can't do every play postmodern, or you can't do this, do that, every text. You cannot do it. It's impossible. It doesn't work. Really, if it works, it's something else that you create with the text all over again, it's something else if you're keen enough to be able to do it. But I mean, so while we were working, 
kind of we were all looking forward to work that way as we used to work at school for our auditions. We dig in, we talk, what's she doing? So many things we t think, we, th we talk, we talk, we talk, we think what it is. We dive in the characters and in the circumstances. It's a great catharsis and, and you love it. And we were looking forward to work that way. So, just like a present, Jason was there. We were all like that. And since because we were all kind of graduated from the same school, we had the same methods to be able to work. But he was talking about the environment, the people, St. Louis, Southern. So theater is acting. It's like life knowledge. You have to know the term and the life, what they eat, even if the audience doesn't know, even if it doesn't say in the text. We have to know what does she wear, even the underwear. Does she put nail polish? What kind of makeup she does, does she? What is the hair, long, short, why, how? All the character, as the actress base, we work on such things. It's a crazy, crazy, hard and long work. But then while working with Jason, he was saying, yes, yes, yes, we were able to talk about the same things at the same level, and you were raising the things up. He was letting us to go more deep, and that was why, I mean, working with you is a big experience because of you, Jason Hale, well, not being just American and knowing the environment very and well. Joanna, you may know this, um, but you know, <clears throat> the context of these great plays, Tennessee Williams, Arthur Miller, it all grew out of this, uh, this method acting, this <coughs> actor's <coughs> studio, right? right? These writers were writing plays for people they knew out of the actor's studio. And our greatest director, who's actually Anatol Anatolian Turk, right, Ilya Kazan, Yes. He paved the way for all, everything in America. He, if it weren't for him, we wouldn't have Tennessee Williams. We wouldn't have Arthur Miller. And it was his approach. And these plays require you to have a very rich inner life going on. Um, and I think in our process of Glass Imagery, we started to work on that inner yep. life. Yep. And not relying just on executing physical actions but rather it's coming more organically through the emotional through line of the characters. And so their needs are very strong. And I think that's what Turks like about these plays so much. Because the needs are very clearly written by the playwrights. Yes. Right? And it's something that you can grab onto and say, I know this. Right? And then when you take the dive and you yes. grab onto yes. that. Yes, it's not because of acting. Sometimes you do, yes, OK. I confess, sometimes not, but it is. Sometimes it's as if the actors just memorize the lines and change the costumes and just walk, you know, from here just on stage. It's not it, it's not it. Otherwise, there wouldn't be anything called theater. It's live, it is. You have to change. You have to let people change. You have to let yourself to be touched. Whatever is happening to you, you have to let it's all flew to your audience, to people that may, might. What is going to happen to me if I go to theater, if I watch this performance? What will happen to me? What happens if I come and see these pictures? What will, how will I change? This should be the kind of inner, even if we know or not. But we're changing. We let ourselves to be touched. Dig, <laughs> then maybe that's unless nothing happens on stage. It reminds me, there was a woman that came up to Meltem after the Glass Menagerie, and she was a mom, and she started crying. Yes. And she felt so guilty. She said, she was like that. She, she didn't she realize really, she was doing that to her. She own was kid. 60 <laughs> or 70, I'm not sure, but she just held my hands and she was crying and saying, did I do this to my children? Did I do this? It's, we all do. I mean, if a mother had a child, 
you turn to Amanda. Slightly, but I mean, it is. You're concerned about your children. She's right. <laughs> it is. You see what, should, what they do, but what they have to do, but you can't control. <clears throat> That's why we understand Tennessee Williams. So obvious. Because it's universal. We understand that, right? <clears throat> Yeah. Broken, skipped, missed lives. Yes. So we'll open this up now for any questions you might have um, for us or any comments. Can I start this off? Yeah. Because you, you mentioned right at the start about the issue of translating and obviously the issue that Blue Roses and so on. Yes. But that, I mean, with something like drama, where the play on words can be really important, that must be a really big issue for the translator and for the actors uh, to convey the meaning that was in the original language. That must be something huge. On every page. It's got, big. Uh, it's big. Say. And Meltem has uh, four projects now in Turkey. I've directed. Meltem was always my assistant, and Meltem always spent at least a week with the actors going through word by word with the translation. Um, and we fix it. You can do that here in Turkey. You can't do that in America. If someone translates a play, you can't change one word. But here, it's kind of loosey-doosey. You can actually take the translation and fix it and still give credit to that person. <laughs> because she really created a new script for Glass Menagerie that I is not John Ugel's script. Amanda all over again, yeah. And we did I the have. same thing with orphans last yes. year. Here's the thing that I discovered. Is Sometimes I mean our translators have bad habits. They add things. And can you imagine John Ugel? <clears throat> probably while he was translating it, he was he he was adding things and it's like I don't know it's English. I um, mean maybe he <coughs> translated with someone night stream to Bahar Noktasa. He said the Midsummer Night's Dream, <clears throat> he wrote it all over again as Bahar Noktası. It works, it's wonderful, it's even, it's best really, I love it. It takes place in Aegean, so yeah. it is perfect. But wish he could have done this the same to Tennessee to Williams. Tennessee Williams yeah. Say it again, by my words. It would be a Turkish lady, right. doesn't matter, it would work, but this time, if I wouldn't translate Amanda, I shouldn't play Amanda like that. Right. You know, like a real local, a little bit crazy mm -hmm. Turkish woman. Right, right, right. <clears throat> kind of. Also, the thing I discovered through working on a few plays uh, in Turkey is curse words. America, Americans are masters at curse words. There's so many ways to use the word F-U-C-K, right? In so many different kinds. It doesn't exist in Turkey. You guys have great curse expressions, right? Yes, we can't say it all the time. But in, yeah. the, in the play Orphans, the language, that foul language is very much a part of their life, right? So we had to find a way to kind of translate that. It was hard. It was hard, because and even you, even Jesus, you, you, you say that, you, the curses that you were giving the examples to us. I'm not going to say okay. them now. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, no, even that, you know, it, it is, yes, we don't. There's a playwright that's not done here very often, who I think is a good playwright, is David Mamet. And he can't, almost impossible to translate him because his whole, under, his whole observation of people in Chicago, specifically, these rough kind of people, it's all curse words. And it doesn't translate. And F-U-C-K can be used many different ways, right? But <laughs> S-I-C can only be... Yes. But we have expressions, don't we? <laughs> Young people, why don't you talk? We don't, we don't use that. We, yeah, we have other than you trying to find. And I'm not good in that. I was asking the kids, you mm. know, just what do you say here instead of this? 
Right. It's not because it's a shame or it's... It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that it works in English, in Turkish, using it all the time. We, we using expressions, you're, you're right. Using, yeah, but yes. our idioms are different. So we discovered one the other day with this Bojek production is the character says, he broke in, right? Yes. In Turkish, when you say, when you translate that, he broke in, he literally broke something, right? But that's the not translation what it means was in, like that. In America, kapı kırı içeri girmiş. Şartlı tahliye kurallarına aykırı. İşte polis haber verin. Kapı filan kırılmıyor. Ben de diyorum ki bu kapıyı kıralım. Yani then I say it's not broken. Nothing is broken. I mean if he says kapı kırılmış, it's broken. It has to be something with the lock. So it shouldn't be closed anymore after just but it's been closing and we were using that, we were opening the door and it's been closing and so, so bro, okay, o zaman zorla içeri girmiş desek olur mu? So she, he forced to be in, then it's working that way. He is doing something with a screwdriver, but again, the door is, it, it, is, it is being closed. So this acting bit is so crazy, you have to justify the things that all the time so you can spend hours just on open the door, close the door, it is break. <laughs> so. We talked about this before with plays. It seems more, you know, we talked about who are the best translators, right? You mentioned this woman who translated Bojack is yeah. very good. She is nice, she's good. But it's almost you need to be an actor. You need to be an actor to translate it because you have to really get into the, the feeling of it, right? And you have, to know, you have to know English pretty good. Thank you. I mean, there's a story that Majid Etaner, the one of the greatest actors in Turkey's, Turkey theater, she says that they're doing this French play, they're doing it, she doesn't know French. She says that there's something wrong here. It shouldn't be. Uh, no, it's okay, but he, I, I forgot the translators. He's a big, big professor. What was his, I can't remember the play now. Uh, Albert Camus, uh, hangisi dört kişilik? Who was it? Anyway, uh, and he insists on, she, she, insists, she says that it's wrong, it's wrong. This lady, this woman, she doesn't say this line. It doesn't work, it is not. So they find the translator, hmm. he comes. And Majide says, this is, as I think, why I mean, what does this mean? It doesn't mean anything, and I don't say this line. Hmm. Just, I don't accept it. It's just, the body refuses it. It's, the actresses do this. And he sees and says, I'm so sorry, I exactly did the wrong translation. Hmm. Then there's a speech that they did. They used to do such <clears throat> talks after the plays. And the translator says, if you're stuck in the translation, ask Majide, she can help you, even if she doesn't know the language. So it is just, you, you know it. In the newer translated plays, is the translator in the rehearsal room? Like for Turkish State Theatre, if, if you have a new play that's been translated, is the translator there? No. No. We assume that everything's right. <laughs> and we have dramaturgs. Yes. It's their work to work on it and to check. Uh -huh. Interesting. How do you feel now working with Turkish actors and students as a director? Do you feel more relaxed or...? or... Yeah, yeah, I think Turkish actors are very, very good. They can tap, they can go to places emotionally quicker, easier, faster than American actors, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. But they have to be encouraged to go there and to understand yeah. what it is to sink your teeth into. But yeah, in the students here, um, if you get a chance to see Bojek, I mean, they're courageous. They're throwing themselves into huge circumstances. Um, last year, I thought the kids and orphans did a really good job of throwing themselves in there. Yeah. So my experience has been very, very good with uh, Turkish actors. They don't, it, it seems Turkish actors don't get in their heads about it. 
American actors get very heady about it. You know, and they, they, don't, they don't throw themselves in. But I find that Turkish actors do. <laughs> yes, thank you, good. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just representing, representing the actors and actresses here, just so proud. Yes. The name of them, <laughs> just, it's not easy. Thank you. But, but no questions, I'm just looking at looking young people for questions and they just listen. They're just listening. Tamam. Ah. Nice. Uh, that, uh, do you think that uh, a Turkish actress, if they play, if they play American plays, and if they have language barriers, if they don't understand English, you think? Yeah. Can, can you repeat it again? Sorry, a bit loud, please. A Turkish actress. Yes. If they play American, American play. Yes. The, the play has, the, the, it, it is the play and the story if it's well done. I mean, as an Turkish actors that I have just, if the play is fine, translation is fine, no problem, doesn't matter, doesn't need to know the language anyway, just you flow with the story and it just happens there. It is just, it's just there. I'm lucky, kind of, just I can, I mean, just because of knowing kind of English, and I'm <laughs> I could just mention that Meltem is a little bit of a freak because you, you started speaking English without taking any class. You were just watching British shows all the time, right? Yeah, but I was. I, That's yeah, why she has a British I, I learned accent. That school, no, yeah, I learned that school, but I mean, I used it. I used it. Yes. It is. You have to use the language to be able to still see it's gone. I told you. So I'm excited. To, my English had run away. I've had a few experiences of directing in other countries. And when <clears throat> this was a great experience having Meltem because she understood English and we could actually fix the translation. But a, a director, a good director, should be able to be able to work with any language. And you can understand that they're yeah. on the emotional vibe of what's happening in the play is the most yeah, important. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't for me now, I mean any any language, any any director, if he knows the story, if we understand each other, even if they're translators, not translator, translators, that's a saying, sometimes they can't translate what the director says to the actress or to the actor. It's a little thing because, let's say that we have a Japanese, whatever, well, doesn't matter. But then, because I'm professional, and if he's a good director, we can understand each other. I can get, even if whatever is happening, the translation bit there, I can understand, I can get, and I can show something to him or he, or can, we, we, we understand each other. And we do we a can, lot of when the, we're in rehearsal, what did she just say there? That doesn't make any sense, yeah. right? And then we find, oh, the Turkish translation puts something else in that has nothing to do with what's happening in that moment. Something like that. Lately, I mean, we have worked with the Russian director in Simbilin, Russian director, English writer, Shakespeare, Turkish actors. <laughs> yes, we had. <laughs> and just translators that just know Russian, Russian Turkish translator, but it's not theater translation, it's not lines and it's not emotions, it's not <laughs> mood, it's not anything. So they just translate what the director says. Ask him, does he want something like that? Or we were doing so, we were getting kind of trying to be, or I was going something, you know, just get, I was trying to ask, do you want no, no emotion on my face, or do you want something else? And okay, blank, fine. I mean, it was just <laughs> instead of going, it is you understand because it's the professional side. 
but no questions. Well, I'm going to have to enter stage yes. left or whatever because the time yes. is now. Yes. We do have no some questions. Time yes. Now, but uh, Melton and Jason, I'm sure, will be hanging around for a few minutes if yeah. you want to have a, a chat with them while the librarians get busy with things. But firstly, let's thank them both for this really. <laughs> <laughs> as well as our speakers today, I would like to thank members of the library staff who worked very hard uh, in preparing these talks, especially Borja and Oku, who are sitting over there. Uh, and just to say that if you're interested in our talks, we shall be back again next semester with three more, uh, uh, perhaps more conventional talks than, uh, uh, than our chat as we have today. Okay, thank you all. I wish you all a happy new year. Thanks. Thank you.